This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. The heart longing of every Christian for the last 2,000 years has been to see the Saviour return and set up an everlasting kingdom on earth. Events in the world reveal that this will happen very soon. Keep listening to learn how you can spiritually prepare for Earth's final events. WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahweh's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return. The Bible repeatedly refers to believers as being born of Yah. But do you know what that means, both literally and for the spiritual life? Hi, I'm Miles Roby, and you're listening to World's Last Chance Radio. So often we toss around terms and jargon. We define words and phrases by how they're used rather than having a clear understanding of what the actual definition is and we can lose nuances that way. That can be a problem, especially in religion. Religion can have its own lexicon. We don't learn these terms in school. We're supposed to just, I don't know, absorb their meanings through osmosis. Anyway, I've asked Dave Wright if he'll talk to us today about just what it means to be born of Yah. Dave, what does it mean to be born of Yah? What does the phrase actually mean? But also, how does that look in the life of the individual believer? Okay, hi. Well, those are great questions. So let's start by reading one of the many passages in Scripture that actually use this phrase. So let's go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 18, and uh, read exactly what it says. This is a good place to start our discussion of this phrase. Mm-hmm. Okay. We know that whoever is born of Yahuwah does not sin, but he who has been born of Yahuwah keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. The marginal reading of keeps himself is guards himself. The phrase I want to focus on, though, is born of Yahuwah, or born of God, as we're used to seeing in our more modern translations. Born of Yah, or born of anyone, really, is not something that we say an awful lot in modern English. No, it sounds a bit awkward, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, absolutely. It comes from the Greek word ganaho. I printed off the definition of it for you there. Could you just read from that paper there and yeah. just tell us what it says? Uh, to procreate, it's translated as begat 49 times and to be born 39 times. Uh, to be delivered, to conceive or make. Um, Ganao, as a verb, means to beget, and in the passive voice means to be born. It is chiefly used of men begetting children. A woman brings forth a child, is delivered or bears the child. It is used of the act of Yah in the birth of Christ. It is used metaphorically in the writings of the Apostle John, of the gracious act of Yahuwah, in conferring upon those who believe the nature and disposition of children, imparting to them spiritual life. I looked up this verse in several different translations. Most of them say, born of Yah, but one of them translates the phrase as fathered by Yah. I think this translation says it in a way that actually is easier for us as modern readers to grasp what it is that John was trying to convey. And I've brought a copy of that with me. So using this translation, can you just there turn to 1 John chapter 5 and just read the first four verses, please? Everyone who believes that Yahushua is the Christ has been fathered by Yah, and everyone who loves the Father loves the child fathered by him. By this we know that we love the children of Yahuwah, whenever we love Yahuwah and obey his commandments. For this is the love of Yahuwah, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments do not weigh us down. 
because everyone who has been fathered by Yha conquers the world. John had grasped an eternal truth of immense significance, and he was trying to encapsulate it into words, and that is the kinship between Christ and believers. As Trinitarians, we believed that Yahushua was divine. We believed that he was both God the Son and the Son of God, to use Trinitarian terminology. And this put him on a level that was far beyond our reach. Yes, we're told, he came to reveal the Father to us. Yes, we were told that he was 100% human while still being 100% divine, a dichotomy that no one can wrap their minds around, so it's just dismissed as a divine mystery. But can we really relate to someone who is even one iota divine? Divinity is so far above humanity that even the clear statements of Scripture that Yahushua is the only begotten of the Father was interpreted to be in reference to his supposed laying aside divinity to take on a human nature. Again, way, way beyond our ability to grasp or even relate to as humans. Do you just love how whenever the doctrine of the Trinity starts to be exposed for the ridiculous contradiction it is, any questions are neatly dismissed as a mystery too great for human minds to comprehend? <laughs> well, what else can they say? It mm. simply does not make sense. And when you study it for yourself, comparing Scripture with Scripture, it becomes clear that it is a doctrine that's not supported by Scripture at all. Mm, it's true. And if you missed any of those previous programs, by the way, you can still find them on our website and on YouTube. We also have a lot of articles in various languages covering that topic. Knowing what we do now, that a triune Godhead was a doctrine adopted from ancient paganism, we now know the truth of what it means for Yahushua to be the only begotten son of Yah. It means that he has a fully human nature. As we've covered in previous programs, in order to be the Messiah, in order to save us from our sins, he had to have had a fully human, not at all divine nature. Being fully human, he didn't have a pre-existence. Like all humans, he came into existence in his mother's womb. That's what the word begot means. Yahweh literally begot him in the womb of Mary. The only difference between Christ and us is that, as the second Adam who redeemed us where the first Adam fell, he had an unfallen nature, but he was still fully human. Mm, wow, it really establishes a bond and a, a link between us and Yahushua, doesn't it? Absolutely. We also are children of Yah. You are a son of Yah. I am a son of Yah. By faith we have been adopted into Yahuwah's family. We are considered every bit as much his children as Yahushua is. Now, let's apply this understanding to what John has to say about believers being born of Yah or fathered by Yah. What this means on a practical level is that Yahuwah helps us, and he helps us in a number of ways. Now, you can see you've still got 1 John chapter 5 open there. Can you start reading for us at verse 14 and read through to verse 18, please? And this is the confidence that we have before him, that whenever we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in regard to whatever we ask, then we know that we have the request that we have asked from him. If anyone sees his fellow Christian committing a sin not resulting in death, he should ask, and Yahuwah will grant life to the person who commits a sin not resulting in death. There is a sin resulting in death. I do not say that he should ask about that. All unrighteousness is sin, but there is sin not resulting in death. We know that everyone fathered by Yahuwah does not sin, but Yahuwah protects the one he has fathered, and the evil one cannot touch him. So, let's talk about this. This is not saying that believers are suddenly pure, perfect and sinless. I used to believe that. That the righteous would reach a state of perfection prior to Christ's return. Oh, me too. I mean, talk about an impossible standard to meet. <laughs> yes, an impossible is quite right. <laughs> Romans chapter 8 tells us that the carnal mind is enmity against Yahuwah, for it is not subject to the law of Yahuwah, neither indeed can be. Now, that's an important word choice. It's not saying that it doesn't want to be. It's saying that it cannot 
be no matter how much it may want to be. This is one of the ways we can know that Yahushua had the nature of Adam before the fall because with a fallen nature it is simply impossible to be subject to Yah's law. And we know he perfectly kept Yah's law. Yes, so don't read into what John is saying here in 1 John chapter 5. He's not saying that believers suddenly keep the law perfectly. That won't be possible until we are gifted with higher natures at Christ's return. But what he is saying is that believers have been gifted with a very unnatural enmity against their own fallen natures. It's not natural for us to hate sin. It's a divine gift. This is the struggle Paul was talking about in Romans chapters 7 and 8. In fact, let's go there now, Miles. This is an important passage because it delineates just how Yahweh helps those who are born of him, who are fathered by him. Can you start with verse 4, please? Yeah, sure. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to Yahweh. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. First John chapter 5, verse 18 says, We know that everyone fathered by Yahweh does not sin, but Yahweh protects the one he has fathered, and the evil one cannot touch him. Well, this is how Yahweh protects those he has fathered, so the evil one cannot touch us. Just drop down there to verse 14 now and read through to the end of the chapter. And as Miles reads, I'd like our listener to pay attention to this point. Remember that the battle being described here is because the soul no longer wants to give in to its natural inclinations. It wants to do what is right, even though, having a fallen nature, it lacks the power to do what is right. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do... I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of Yah, according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank Yahuwah through Yahushua Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of Yah, but with the flesh the law of sin. Now this is huge. We've never fully appreciated this passage, but this is a conflict that should encourage, not discourage us. Why? Because this is a conflict only those who are being fathered by Yahweh ever have. Notice verse 22, For I delight in the law of Yah according to the inward man. Sure, he can't keep Yah's law because he's got a fallen nature, but he delights in it nonetheless. Romans chapter 8 verse 7, The carnal mind is enmity against Yahweh. For it is not subject to the law of Yahuwah, nor indeed can be. So for there to be this level of conflict means that something fundamental has changed. What was hateful to him is now something he wants, which is purity and oneness with the Father. And this is a divine gift that Yahuwah gives his children, those he has fathered. He supernaturally gives them a love for purity and holiness that is unnatural to the fallen nature. This is how he protects believers, so that the evil one can't touch us. 
This is incredibly encouraging. So, yeah, we may still stumble and fall into sin. We still have our fallen natures. But when you're fathered by Yahuwah, the desire for holiness is there. What was once easy acceptance of sin is now a battle as we strive against it. Exactly, yes. Don't let Satan implant the thought that simply because you're striving and often failing is proof that you're not truly converted. On the contrary, the fact that you no longer desire sin and that you even want to be at one with Yah, the fact that you're striving against sin at all, reveals that you have been fathered by Yahuwah and he has gifted you with enmity against sin and a desire for holiness. And what this passage in 1 John chapter 5 reveals is that this is a gift that he keeps on giving. And how do you mean? I mean, where, where do you get that then? Okay, well, read verse 18 of 1 John chapter 5 again, and let's okay. just get that clearly in mind. We know that everyone fathered by Yahuwah does not sin, but Yahuwah protects the one he has fathered, and the evil one cannot touch him. You have to know Greek grammar to pick up on this, but there's a meaning here that is lost in our English translations that I really want to explain. The first use of fathered in this verse is in the perfect tense, and this means that in the original it is describing a continuous, ongoing condition that starts at a past event and continues on without stopping. Okay. What John is describing here is the ongoing relationship between Yahuwah and his children. We weren't just fathered once at conversion, we are continuing to be fathered every moment of our existence as sons and daughters of Yah. In other words, we are being parented by Yahuwah on an ongoing basis. When you apply this concept to born-again terminology, it becomes clear that when we are born again, when we are fathered by Yahuwah, we step into a brand new relationship. And that relationship with Him as our loving Father, helping us all along the way, is a continuous one. Wow, that really is beautiful. Very hope-inspiring. He continues to parent us. This is why Paul could write what he did in Romans chapter 8 after describing the terrible struggle in Romans chapter 7. Why don't you start reading there at verse 1 for us? Okay. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Yahushua, because through Christ Yahushua, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, Yahuwah did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is Hostile to Yah. It does not submit to Yah's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please Yahuwah. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of Yahuwah lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. This is the practical effect on the life when we are fathered by Yahuwah, when we are parented by Him. It's a tremendous gift. It's what life looks like when you are a brother, a sister of Yahushua, and a child of Yahuwah. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ, at 93.30 kHz on the 31-metre band. World's Last Chance Radio. Preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. OK, so we're still at 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. We know that everyone fathered by Yahuwah does not sin. Everyone. That's more than one. That's all. That's referring to all believers. Then John goes on and switches from plural to singular, saying... 
But Yahuwah protects the one he has fathered, and the evil one cannot touch him. Of course, this can refer to the individual believer, but it also refers in a special way to Yahushua. And this becomes clear when, again, you understand Greek grammar. Oh, grammar. Oh, I, don't, I don't like it in English, let alone a language I can't speak, to be honest. <laughs> yes, I hear what you're saying, but this is interesting. The Greek verb used here is in the aorist tense. And this means that it's referring to a one-time event that happened in the past. Oh, okay, right. So that can refer to the moment of conversion when the individual believer grasps salvation by faith. And it can also refer to Yahushua's point of origin when Yahuwah conceived him in the womb of Mary. Yes, that's right. Right, right okay. I don't know why we never saw it before, back when we were Trinitarians, but the Gospel accounts emphasize that Yahushua's point of origin, as you put it, was conception, when the Holy Spirit came upon Mary. Luke says, precisely for that reason. Now, what reason? Uh, the Holy Spirit's coming upon a virgin and creating a fertilized egg in her. Right. Precisely for that reason, the baby to be fathered will be called Holy and the Son of Yahuwah. And you can read all about that in the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Yahushua was literally fathered by Yahuwah when Mary became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. We become children of Yahuwah, we are fathered by him when our faith grasps the promise of salvation. This is beautiful because it's so encouraging. And I'm assuming with such an important theme, this is going to appear elsewhere throughout the New Testament. Is that right? Absolutely right, yes. Right, okay. The other New Testament writers all clearly grasp this. And once you have it firmly in mind, other passages of Scripture come alive. For example, let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. In fact, Miles, yes, if you could just go there and read it for mm -hmm. us, please. Already there. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to Yahuwah, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Now, take what we just read here, and let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Yahushua the son of Yah, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest incapable of sympathizing with our weaknesses but one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace whenever we need help. Yahushua was fully human, just like we are. The only difference was that he had the nature of Adam before the fall. He had to if he were to overcome exactly where Adam fell. In his very humanity, in his struggles and temptations, in every particular of his life, Yahushua is our brother. He is the firstborn, and we are all children of Yahuwah and joint heirs with Christ. So would you turn again to Romans chapter 8? We read the first few verses in our last segment, but there are some more verses that I'd like to get to. That Romans chapter 8, and this time can you read verses 13 to 17? If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of Yahuwah, these are sons of Yahuwah. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of Yahuwah. And if children then heirs, heirs of Yahuwah, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Being fathered or parented by Yahuwah brings with it so many, many, many blessings. Yes, it brings with it the gift of enmity against evil, which is unnatural to our fallen natures, but by which we cooperate with Yah in the battle against evil. It brings with it the high status of sonship, being considered sons and daughters of the Most High. It also brings with it a very close fellowship with Christ himself. He is our older brother. This makes us co-heirs with Christ, heirs of Yah. It's an extraordinary gift and legacy. Yeah, and speaking for myself, it also gives me confidence. Knowing that Yahushua has been tempted in all the ways I've been tempted, 
He says he understands. He understands that what it's like to be stressed, to be tired, to be maxed out. Satan comes along and presses guilt down on us, which tends to separate us from Yah. But knowing that our older brother has been tempted, just like we were tempted too, gives me the confidence to go to Yahuwah for help instead of staying away. Absolutely, yes. Feeling free to go to Yahuwah for help, for comfort, for understanding, knowing we won't be judged. Mm. All of these are the privileges of being fathered by Yahuwah, accepted as his own sons and daughters. So let's head back to 1 John. Now, I'd like you to read 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, uh, right the way through to the first verse of chapter 3. And now, children, abide in him, so that when he is revealed, we may have boldness and not be put to shame before him at his royal appearing. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been fathered by him. Look at the remarkable love the Father has given us, that we should be called Yahuwah's children. That is indeed what we are. So here, John's saying that an identifying hallmark of being fathered by Yahuwah is that the person does what is right. So what part do we play then, Dave? How do we reach the point of being fathered by Yahuwah? Because that's a fantastic gift. How do we reach that type of relationship with him? Okay, well, a great question there, Miles. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. And once you're there, can you read verses 18 through to 23? That's Matthew chapter 13, 18 to 23. Here, Yahushua is telling the parable of the sower, and he identifies many different classes of believers. Okay. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, Then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Our new birth, when we enter that father-child relationship with Yahuwah, begins when we make the conscious choice of our own free will to accept the seed. The seed, of course, is the gospel message. That is receiving the seed into good ground. But if we're truly embracing the ongoing relationship of being fathered by Yahuwah, we don't stop there. We continue on, giving what's been planted time to spring up, and grow and mature. We continue on to bring forth good fruit. Now John alludes to this in 1 John chapter 2, verses 28 to 29. So, Mars, could you just flip over to that again, please, for us? Mm-hmm. Um, it's 1 John chapter 2, verses 28 to 29. Okay. And now, little children remain in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame when he comes back. If you know that he is righteous, you also know that everyone who practices righteousness has been fathered by him. When you apply this concept of being fathered by Yahuwah to the passages that discuss the new covenant, you will find that they all consistently present believers who are in this special relationship as being given tremendous gifts and great outpourings of love. They then, in turn, strive to live in obedience to Yah's revealed will. Now this is important because... While we'll never be perfect as long as we have fallen natures, at the same time, those who are fathered by Yahuwah make the conscious choice to put their wills on the side of his will. That's a good, very good point, actually, uh, Dave. I mean, Yahuwah will never force the will. So we have to consciously choose to surrender it to him. And because he understands the impossibility of perfection, so long as we have fallen natures, in his love and kindness, he accepts these efforts and intents as our highest good. 
I mean, that's what we do for our kids as parents, right? You ask your young son to do something knowing he's unlikely to be able to do as good a job as you can, but you accept his best efforts, yes? That's what our divine parent does for us too. As long as we have fallen natures, we'll always have failings. But abundant, abundant forgiveness is available. Yeah, reminds me of what Christ said in his Sermon on the Mount. Uh, let me just find it really quickly here on my screen. Uh, it's Matthew 7, verses 17 to 20. It says, Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. People who are being fathered by Yahweh have been grafted in. We may have started as branches of a bad tree, but through divine grace and infinite love, we're grafted in. So, for the rest of our time today, I'd like to take a look at some passages of Scripture that either expound upon, refer to, or even just allude to this idea of the ongoing reality of being parented by Yahweh. This is fundamental to our calling both as believers and as sons and daughters of the Most High. One area that is impacted by this relationship is that we're called to love people just as Yahweh loves them and as Christ showed in his treatment of others. Now, you're at Matthew 7 there. Just go back to Matthew chapter 5. This is also in the Sermon on the Mount. And when you're in chapter 5 there, Miles, could you read verses 43 through to 48, please? You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. We may still have fallen natures, but we can choose to treat others with the same kindness, respect and compassion that the Father shows us. This reveals the father-child relationship that we have with him. James, in his little epistle, also alludes to this special relationship and the impact that it has on us. And I'd like you to read it, actually. James chapter 1, verses 17, 18 and then 21 and pay attention to how being fathered by Yahuwah has a very practical impact on our lives. James, James, where for that though? James. Ah, oh yeah. All generous giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or the slightest hint of change. By his sovereign plan, he gave us birth through the message of truth, that we would be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So put away all filth and evil excess and humbly welcome the message implanted within you, which is able to save your souls. Just also read verses 22 and 23, please. Yeah, sure, Dave. But be sure you live out the message and do not merely listen to it and so deceive yourselves. For if someone merely listens to the message and does not live it out, he is like someone who gazes at his own face in a mirror. Those who have been born of and are being fathered by Yahweh are more than hearers of the word. They're also doers of the word. This is seen in how they live their lives and how they treat others. Now often in our Daily Mailbag segment we're presented with questions of the how do I treat someone who doesn't believe the way I do variety. The answer is always, you treat them with the same compassion and loving kindness the Father treats us. Mm. Peter also expands on this theme of being born of and fathered by Yahweh. So let's go there now. First Peter, chapter 1. <laughs> you and your tiny little books. <laughs> <laughs> well, it comes right after James. Yeah, so helpful. Uh, right, here it is. Uh, first Peter. Um, Peter, which verse, by the way, in First Peter? 
Uh, First Peter chapter 1 is verses 3 and 23. Okay. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Yahushua Christ. By his great mercy he gave us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Yahushua Christ from the dead. You have been born anew, not from perishable, but from imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of Yahuwah. Notice that in each of these passages, a proactive response is required from those who would be in that special relationship of being fathered by Yahuwah. First, they must sincerely desire the truth, what Peter calls the imperishable seed. Also, they become purified by obedience and choosing to turn from known sin. Turn now to the first chapter of the Gospel of John, and we can find this theme throughout the New Testament, but John seems to have grasped it the best. He certainly wrote about it the most. That's John chapter 1, verses 12 to 13. To all who have received him, those who believe in his name, he has given the right to become Yahuwah's children, children not born by human parents or by human desire or a husband's decision, but by Yah. This idea of a rebirth or a new birth is one that John learned from Yahushua himself. You'll recall how early in his ministry, Nicodemus came to speak privately with the Saviour. He was curious about this new teacher, but hey, he had a reputation to maintain, so he came at night when no one could see him. Let's read how Yahushua explained salvation to Nicodemus. He didn't need to teach him parables. Nicodemus was a very well-educated man. He knew the scriptures. So Yahushua spoke plainly to him in a way he hadn't yet spoken even to his own disciples. So we're going to go to John chapter 3, verses 3 to 7. Yahushua replied, I tell you the solemn truth. Unless a person is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of Yahuwah. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter his mother's womb and be born a second time, can he? Yahushua answered, I tell you the solemn truth. Unless a person is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of Yah. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must all be born from above. Yahushua is here explaining how believers are regenerated through faith. They are born from above. They are fathered by Yahuwah. This is how that supernatural enmity against their own fallen natures is implanted. Isn't it interesting that it's it's in the same conversation that one of the most well-known passages of Scripture appears? Uh, John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For Yah so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For Yahuwah did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And the way we're saved? By becoming sons and daughters of Yahuwah, being born again and then reared or fathered by him. That's why, or should I say how, 1 John chapter 3 verse 9 could say, Everyone who is fathered by Yahuwah does not go on sinning, because Yahuwah's offspring remains in him. They cannot go on sinning because they have been fathered by Yahuwah. By having enmity to sin implanted in our hearts. I mean, that's such a great gift. Oh, yes, it truly is, yes. So in conclusion, I just want to say that being born of Yah, being born again or born from above, being fathered by Yahuwah, is far more all-encompassing than a simple mental assent to ideas preached in a sermon or read in an article. It encompasses a very real, very life-changing reality and the blessings are profound and ongoing. Mm. It's not a one-and-done bestowment, it's ongoing. And it makes sense. I mean, after all, Yahuwah is our father. Being fathered by him is more than being born again. As any parent will tell you, birth is just the beginning. Mm. There's a lot more that goes into parenting than just the act of procreation or just an act of giving birth. You know, all the years to follow when you strive to train them up, teach them to be honourable, yah fearing individuals, the, the work of parenting just begins at birth. 
It's true, yes. And that's how it is with being parented by Yahweh too. He's there for us every step of the way. And it's not always easy. And that's why Yahushua says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Yahweh isn't one of those parents that do the bare minimum for the first few years of life and then aged 18 or 21 or whatever says, There's the door. Yeah, you are. You're on your own. He wants to spend eternity with us, and he'll do absolutely everything in his power to get us there. Amen. Stay tuned, folks. Sub next. Is depression a sin? Find out when Dave addresses a question sent into our daily mailbag. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 93.30 kilohertz on the 31 metre band. World's Last Chance Radio. Preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Today's question is coming from the country that has the second longest highway in the entire world. It's nearly 8,000 kilometres in length. That's about 4,860 miles for our metric challenge friends from across the pond. (laughs) Um, Let me guess. Australia? Uh, Good guess, but no. Australia has the world's longest highway. This country has the world's second highway longest highway, as well as possesses an incredible 60% of the world's natural lakes. Wow. Um, oh, oh I, I don't know. Give up. It is home, by the way, to the only walled city in North America. Um, oh, Canada. Canada. Yeah, well, I'm surprised you knew that one. Well, I know that Quebec is the only walled city in North America. I learned this from a school project that uh, my youngest was working on. (laughs) Yes, out of the mouths of babes. Indeed. Uh, Right, okay, today's question then. That's coming from Avery in Coquilliton. Coquilliton? Anyway, it's British Columbia in Canada. And she writes, For the last few years, I've been struggling with depression. I'm a member of a Christian youth group for teens and young adults. The leader likes to think he's created a safe place for us to talk and share, but the truth is, depression is one of his blind spots. He has no time or patience for it and thinks it's a choice or a matter of will because it's clear from group discussions how he feels about this. It's not something I feel I can bring up with him. In fact, after listening to him, I feel guilty for struggling with depression, which isn't helping the depression at all. Am I sinning for being depressed? Okay. Well, the short answer, no. Okay, and the long answer, Dave? Absolutely not. I have no patience with Christians who place a burden of guilt on others who are already struggling. That's not what Yahushua would do. It's not what Yahuwah does either. There are several points that I'd like to address here, but let's just talk about this one first. We need to stop flagellating brothers and sisters in Christ whose struggle is different from ours. Did Yahushua ever scold anyone who came to him for help? Did he ever tell them that if they just exercise enough strength of will, they could overcome whatever it was that was troubling them? No, of course not. No, he's always encouraged people to come just as they were. In fact, you quoted it just a minute ago. Was it uh, Matthew 11, verses 28 and 29? Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He's not saying, just pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. He's saying, come to me and I will give you rest. And that was the mission of the Messiah. Yes, to save us from our sins, but also to bring comfort and encouragement. Miles, turn, if you would, please, to Isaiah chapter 42. And Mm. when you're there, just read the first four verses. Okay. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teachings the islands will put their hope. We've quoted verse 3 many times before. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. 
But notice that in context, this compassionate, patient treatment of those suffering is linked to his work of establishing justice in the earth. So, no, we're not doing Yar's work when we go around kicking those who are already down, telling them that if they just had enough willpower, if they just had enough faith, they wouldn't be struggling. That, that's a horrible message to give anyone. There are plenty of godly people in Scripture who suffer from depression. Mm. Oh, uh, David's a good example of that, actually. He struggled with depression and anxiety as well, and yet he still was called a man after Yar's own heart. David had lots of faults, and Scripture doesn't lightly gloss over them either. Mm. David killed Uriah and stole his wife. He lied, causing the deaths of all the priests of Nob and their families. He numbered Israel. Yahweh himself called him a man of blood from his youth. But struggling with depression, which he did, you're right, is not listed as one of his sins. And he really did struggle with depression. You could practically let the Bible fall open to anywhere in the Psalms, and I know not all the Psalms were written by David, but you could let it open practically anywhere and find the songwriter sounding very depressed. Well, I mean, just look, just right here, just listen to this. It's Psalm 77. I cried out to Elohim for help. I cried out to Elohim to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought Yahuwah. At night I stretched out untiring hands, and I would not be comforted. I was too troubled to speak. Then he asked a series of questions, so listen to this. Will Yahuwah reject forever? Will he never show his favour again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has Elohim forgotten to be merciful? Has he, in anger, withheld his compassion? Yes, the Psalms express very human emotions. It's why they're so relatable, I suppose. We tend to automatically equate human with sinful. But we were created to be human. Not everything that's human is sinful, and Yahweh created us to have emotions. Yahushua himself had times of very deep, soul-crushing depression. Look at his experience in Gethsemane. In fact, let's just go there now in the Gospels. Let's go to Matthew chapter 26, and uh, let's remind ourselves what it says there. If you could start with uh, verse 36. Then Yahushua went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Luke's account is even more graphic. Here you are. Just, I printed it off there. Can you just read that? Okay. It's from Luke 22, and uh, where I've marked it there, verses 43 and 44. Mm -hmm. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. So here an angel from heaven comes and strengthens him, and yet his mental and emotional anguish is so great that he is literally sweating blood. Now this is uh, describing an actual medical condition. It's very rare, but it does happen. It's called hematidrosis. The website webmd.com says, quote, Doctors don't know exactly what triggers hematidrosis in part because it's so rare. They think it could be related to your body's fight-or-flight response. It seems to be caused by extreme distress or fear, such as facing death, torture, or severe ongoing abuse. It's probably where the term sweating blood, meaning a great effort, comes from." Unquote. It can be related to very high blood pressure, which is also a sign of tremendous stress and or pain. So if Yahushua were experiencing such emotional pain that it brought on this rare condition, it clearly wasn't a sin then. Yahushua's entire life was without sin. And do you think he came down to the very end and sinned by experiencing these very negative emotions? Well, no. Depression is not a sin. Sadness is not a sin. We need to remove the stigma that surrounds mental health issues. It's been many years since humanity had access to the tree of life. Our bodies have ailments. It stands to reason that our brains and our emotions would as well. After all, our brain is part of our body. 
You could say it's the most important part of our body. Does it stand to reason that everything else would decline but not our brains or emotions? No. You said we need to remove the stigma surrounding mental health issues, and you're right. There really is a stigma attached to anything to do with mental health in some cultures more than others. Let me just ask you this, though, Dave. What are your thoughts on taking medication for mental health issues then? I know a lot of people see it as a kind of a crutch. I know. They view it as a cop-out. It's part of the you-can-make-yourself-happy-if-you-just-exercise-enough willpower mindset. Mm. Here's the thing, though. That's a very arrogant, and I'll add, judgmental mindset. Take, for example, the manic depression that comes with bipolar disorder. Currently, experts believe that bipolar disorder is caused by one of, or a combination of, genetics, brain chemistry and biology, and or environmental factors. Now, which one of those is the individual's fault? Are they to blame for the genetics they inherited? No. If their brain chemistry is literally out of balance, can just exercising more force of will cause their body to produce the correct balance of, well, whatever goes into having a correct brain chemistry? Well, of course not, no. If your body literally is producing too much or not enough of serotonin or dopamine or, I don't know, no repinephrine, it's going to affect your sleep, your libido, your ability to concentrate, your appetite, your moods and emotions, and no amount of willpower is going to change that. So the last thing any of us need to be doing is going around condemning others. We don't know why they have the struggles they do, but it's not our place to judge. Maybe someone is depressed because of unresolved trauma. Maybe it's a hormonal imbalance. That's why it's always good to speak to your medical provider if you're dealing with depression. But let's not do what Christ himself wouldn't. Let's not break a bruised reed. Let's not snuff out a smouldering wick. Let's not kick someone who is down and tell them that they're sinning for struggling. As sinners, we all have enough for which to feel guilty already. Depression, sadness, negative emotions should never be one of them. And that's true. It's a very, very good point. Oh, and postpartum depression. That's very real and is caused by fluctuations in hormone levels. It's not something a woman should be castigated for. Yahwa is far more understanding and sympathetic and far less judgmental than many of those who claim to worship Yah. It's sad, but true. Let those of us without sin cast the first stone, right? Thanks for a balanced answer, Dave. I know you'll encourage many, many more. And if you've got a question or comment, a prayer request, know that we'd like to hear from you too. Just go to worldslastchance.com and click on Contact Us. It's quick, it's easy, and we really do enjoy hearing from you. Hello, this is Elise O'Brien with your daily promise from Yah's Word. Friday, March 6, 2015, was a day of both tragedy and miracles for the Grosbeck family. 25-year-old Lynn Grosbeck was driving home to Springville, Utah in the United States after visiting her parents in Salem. In the car with her was her 18-month-old daughter, Lily. No one knows for sure what happened, but about 10.30 that night while halfway home, Lynn's car struck a cement barrier as she was crossing a bridge. The car with mother and daughter in it came to rest upside down on the rocky banks of the Spanish Fork River. The vehicle was partially submerged in the icy, fast-moving waters. The temperatures that night and into the next morning were hovering around freezing. Although the bridge gets a lot of traffic, no one saw the car below because the cement barrier blocked their view. Saturday, shortly after noon, a fisherman saw the upside-down car and called it into authorities. Soon, police and rescue workers were on site. As they gathered there, everyone clearly heard an adult voice call, Help me! Help me! Officer Jared Warner recalls, It wasn't just in our heads. To me, it was plain as day. I remember hearing a voice that didn't sound like a child, just saying, help me. Spanish Fork police officer Tyler Beddoes agreed, telling CBS News affiliate KUTV, 
Someone said, help me inside that car. Rescue workers quickly turned the car over. Lynn was dead in the front seat, but Lily was still alive, strapped into her car seat in the back. She had been dangling above the water, rushing through the car's broken windows. A firefighter jumped into the icy river and cut the straps of the car seat, carefully extracting the unconscious child. A human line was formed as they quickly passed the little girl from one person to the next. The water was so cold that four firefighters and three police officers were treated for hypothermia at a local hospital. The question is, who called for help? Lynn died in the crash, and baby Lily was not only too young to call for help, but was unconscious from exposure. But someone had, and Lily's life was spared. The officers who heard the voice call for help all agree it was divine help to save Lily's life. In Matthew 18, verse 10, Yahushua said, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Psalm 34 verse 7 says, The angel of Yahweh encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. We have been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. Please join us again tomorrow, and until then, remember, Yahuwah loves you, and he is safe to trust. Are you facing a situation where you need divine help and guidance? There is power in prayer. Yahuwah is just longing to answer the prayer of faith. If you would like others to join with you in prayer, visit our website and click on Prayer Requests. The WLC team prays over the prayer list each day, and others around the world can join with you in seeking the Father's face. Remember, prayer moves the arm of omnipotence. Let us join you in prayer at worldslastchance.com. You have been listening to WLC Radio. World's Last Chance is committed to bringing the gospel of the Kingdom of Yah to the world. Prophecy and current events indicate the Saviour will return in the very near future. This will be followed by gifting the saints with immortality and setting up Yah's kingdom here on earth. There's no time to waste. Accept the gift of salvation today and allow Yahuwah to cover you with the righteousness of Christ. This program, as well as past episodes of Radio WLC, are available on our website at worldslastchance.com. Click on the Radio WLC icon at the top right of the home page. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahuwah's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return.